Lieutenant Colonel Lincoln S. Ferris here with my trusty PIPOC. Now, every now and again, you'll come across an article or a presentation that says, if we were just more ruthless, if we just out savaged the criminals, if we would just terrorize the terrorists, we would win the fight, we would end things quickly and efficiently. Not really true. But more importantly, the authors of these things are confusing ability with political will. And war is a political fight. Now, as always, these are my thoughts, my ideas, not endorsed by the U.S. Army or U.S. KPOC or anybody else. Let's get started. Why Total War is not an option. And I chose that title for a very specific reason, because a political fight with violence, which is what war is, and an existential crisis are not the same thing. This presentation is a direct response to the article Hunter Killer Teams Attacking Enemy Safe Havens, which was written by Colonel Selesky, who is now retired, and published by the Joint Special Operations University in Report 10-1. If you get a chance, check out JSOU. They're online, or if you're really lucky, you can go down and take a course there in person. Good stuff, recommend it. Now, what Colonel Selesky proposed was taking the actions of Church's Rangers and using that in a modern sense to deny safe havens. Now, this is not a new idea. This was proposed by Colonel Thomas Hams, who wrote The Sling and the Stone when he was a colonel in the Marine Corps, and William Lind, who's been around a long time. They've combined together to form what they call fourth generation warfare. Not a new idea. Taking the fight to the enemy using similar tactics as the enemy. But the problem is both fourth generation warfare and hunter killer teams have the same fundamental problem. The fundamental problem is they're not proposing war, they're just proposing mass criminal actions. Because remember, war is differentiated from criminality by being a conflict between two sovereign states to resolve a political dispute. It's publicly sanctioned. There's a declaration of war. It's conducted by lawful combatants who are recognized agents of that state. The agents are uniform. They act in accordance with the ruler's dictates, what we'd call modern vassalage. They're bound by internal and external legal systems. Violence and other activities performed by the agents are conducted in accordance with the laws of warfare and other international norms. It's conducted against the leadership of a polity, not the populace. It has a political person purpose. It's not for personal enrichment or eradication. And it gets worse. The Geneva Conventions, which define what is and is not a legal combatant, which conceptually everyone is bound by, defines a lawful combatant as one being commanded by a person responsible to, for his subordinates, whatever your people do or fail to do, having a fixed distinctive sign recognizable at a distance, carrying arms openly, conducting their operations in accordance with the laws and customs of war. That makes you a privileged combatant, a legal combatant, a member of a just war. What is proposed with the hunter killer team is the opposite of that. To further reinforce this point, let's talk about what the US says makes someone a lawful combatant. Member of the regular forces of a state party engaged in hostilities, de jure sovereignty. Member of a militia, volunteer corps, organized resistance belonging to a state party engaged in hostilities, which are under a responsible commander. Fixed distinctive sign, carry their arms openly, abide by the laws of war. Again, fitting right in with the Geneva Convention. Or lastly, a member of a regular armed force who professes allegiance to a government engaged, but not recognized by the US, something with de facto sovereignty. So the US even goes a little further than what Geneva Conventions do in recognizing what makes someone a just or a lawful or a privileged combatant. It's not just enough to define what makes someone a legal combatant. You also have to define what makes someone a non-combatant. Geneva Conventions helps out with some of this. Geneva Conventions say civilians who are not taking a direct part in hostilities, direct part being important, are defined by the Geneva Conventions Article 3, that such persons, non-combatants, shall in all circumstances be treated humanely with the following prohibitions. No violence to life and person, in particular murder of all kinds, mutilation, cruel treatment, torture, no taking of hostages, no outrages upon personal dignity, in particular humiliating and degrading treatment, no passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without previous judgment pronounced by a regularly constituated court. 
So you can't just set up a quick drumhead militia or military uh, tribunal and start executing people willy-nilly. So what's happened is you defined what makes someone a protected, protected being protected by civilian reprisal, soldier conducting soldierly activities, and what constitutes a non-combatant not involved in hostilities and how they are to be protected from outrages upon their person and the dignity. So what happens if you belong to a group that doesn't follow this? What does that make you? So a little bit more of non-combatant ideas here. Military equipment is fair game. You can destroy it, take it, whatever you need to. It, as is military associated equipment. So machine shops, railroads, supply depots, those all can be damaged in the name of uh, military necessity. Those all can be seized in the names of military necessity. They can be cordoned off and blocked. However, items not directly involved in the war effort, say sheep, housing, hospitals, those are to be protected. Believe it or not, the International Criminal Court has 11 crimes against humanity, murder, extermination, deportation or forcible transfer, false imprisonment, torture, rape, sexual slavery, enforced sterilization, ethnic persecution, disappearance, apartheid, other inhumane acts of a similar character. All of these are things that the International Criminal Court will try to prosecute people for. Now, some will say that, hey, this whole concept of civilian versus military it's just a post-World War II construct that we came up with because the Nazis were so bad and the Imperial Japanese were so bad. And that's only partially true because as far as the U.S. is concerned, the concept of a separation between soldiers and civilians has been around since the Articles of Capitulation signed by General Cornwallis at the surrender at Yorktown in 1781. You can find the Articles of Capitulation online. I believe they're stored by the National Archives. There's 12 articles and it lays out the treatment. So you've got, you know, Article 1, land troops remain prisoners of the United States. Article 2, all that military equipment is going to be taken by the U.S. military. However, in Article 4, officers can retain their sidearms and both officers and soldiers to keep their private property of every kind. Baggage and papers that were taken during the siege were likewise to be preserved and returned. Soldiers would get the same food as a U.S. soldier. British officers could visit the encampments where the prisoners were being held to make sure they were treated properly and could bring additional supplies. Article 7, articles, uh, officers were allowed to keep soldiers of servants. In the British Army, they allowed that. We never did that in the U.S. Army. Article 9, the traders who were trading with the British at Yorktown were allowed to preserve their property. Article 11, proper hospitals to be furnished for the sick and wounded. For the British sick and wounded, we were to set up hospitals for them to treat them. And in Article 14, no article of capitulation shall be infringed upon pretense of reprisals. And if you remember back from an earlier one where we talked about the Asgill affair, where Washington was ready to hang a captain until the French stepped in and said, hey, hey, can't do that. We signed those uh, articles of capitulation as well. We had a real problem going on. And that was with some serious provocation. The British, you know, they, they played a lot of fast and loose with the rules. We held to them as Americans. We separated out civilian from military, private property from governmental property. And we've done that ever since then. Even back in 1865, when Lee surrendered to Grant, there were five articles to the surrender. Sidearms could be retained. The soldiers could return home. They didn't even put them in POW camps. And they could keep their privately owned horses. So again, now that the war was over, they were civilians and treated as such. Got a little more hard nose when it came to the, German, the surrender of the Nazis in 45. There were only six articles. We basically said, you got unconditional surrender. You're gonna turn over everything, damage nothing. Again, military equipment. And the event of non-compliance, reprisals were fully authorized up to whatever. Harsh, but we never had to get to do that. What is proposed with the hunter killer teams is even beyond that. We've defined what makes someone a soldier, a just or a legal combatant. 
We defined what makes someone a civilian. We've shown how, since the beginning of the founding of the country, technically before that, where we made the distinction between public property used for a war effort and private property used by the individual and how those are two separate and distinct groups. What Colonel Selesky proposes is doing away with all of that. He proposes going back to the 1600s, using the actions of churches rangers during King Philip's war as a modern method of counterinsurgency. Now, Thomas Ham, uh, Colonel Hams and William Lind with their fourth generation, same thing, same ideas, same concept, throwing away almost 400 years of tradition and international norms and standards to achieve victory against insurgents. Now, the problem is both philosophies, this is total war. There are no innocents. The, the idea here is that everybody is a combatant and it's a violation of everything that the country has been founded on, that we've held sacred as a tradition and every written code of just warfare since the Lieber Code of 1863. If you didn't grow up in New England and you never heard about King Philip's War or Church's Rangers, let me give you a quick history of what happened so that you understand what Colonel Selesky is talking about and suggesting in his article. Now, the colonists by and large got along with most of the Indian groups, by and large. Yes, there's a Pequot War and a few other things, but by and large things were pretty good until 1675. And what happened was the Wampanoags got a new uh, chief. And he decided to consolidate power through attacking the British colonists. And that was part of the reason. But there was also just a lot of diplomatic failures. You had various groups fighting over who controlled the fur trade and who got money for the fur trade. What kind of weapons could be sold to the Indians or not sold to the Indians? You had who owned what land. You had various tribal affiliations merging and splitting apart. You had the Algonquin uh, Algonquin versus Iroquois nation fight going on, both directly and through proxies, as well as money and some politically motivated murders. You have the reasons why King Philip's War happened, but how did it turn into an existential crisis of survival for the colonists in New England? The first thing was that European military tactics were ineffective in frontier warfare. The Indians would decline battle. They would cede ground, disappear into the woods. And while most towns had a palisade or a stockade to protect the town and a militia, from the very beginning, the colonists were on the back foot and fighting a defensive war, which they were not winning. So half of the New England's towns, out of about 90, were attacked by, uh, 52 out of 90 were attacked by the Indians. 12 of them were completely destroyed. Springfield was burned almost completely to the ground. There was one stone blockhouse that survived. One in 10 men died. There were maybe 60 to 100,000 colonists in New England. One in 10 men died. That would be the equivalent of losing California in today's numbers. And the, the problem was the way the Indians attacked was they would come in for a raid, burning and destroying everything they could they didn't see combatant, non-combatant. They just killed whoever they could and took captives for ransom, for slavery, and would disappear. And one of the more famous captives was a woman named Mary Rowlandson, who was ransomed back to her husband after 11 months for 20 pounds. She'd been sold multiple times in slavery and large portions of her family died. The other issue that really got everyone's hackles up were the Indian propensity to torture captives. And there's a place in Rhode Island called Nine Men's Misery where nine people uh, met a very grisly fate. Further, food and crops were destroyed. Animals were slaughtered. Buildings were fired. So if they couldn't kill you directly, they'd starve you to death. And really the Indian way of battle was total war. It was an attempt at eradication of a population. So the governor Josiah Wilson, who was the governor of the Plymouth Colony in Massachusetts, think modern day Boston, went to his military aide, a guy named Benjamin Church, and said, here's a commission to become a captain. I want you to raise a military force to stop the Wampanoag and other Indian tribes. 
what Church did was he used the Indian tactics against the Indians. Instead of meeting them force on force, he broke his group or his company down into small flexible forces who used the woods and the ground for cover rather than the typical European practice of a frontal attack in a military formation. So they conducted raids and ambushes and they ranged. That's how they became rangers. Uh, and it was the first ranger force in America before Rogers Rangers and any of the others. And they would scout until a village, Indian village was discovered and they would attack the village while there are no warriors there, kill whoever was there and fire the village. And what this did was war parties no longer had a safe haven. They didn't have food, they didn't have shelter, they didn't have resupply. So Church's Rangers conducted raids, but very different from a modern day raid. Modern day raid is an operation to temporarily seize an area to secure information, confuse an adversary, capture personnel or equipment, or to destroy a capability. And it ends with a planned withdrawal upon completion of the assigned mission. Nowhere does it say, shoot non-combatants and burn the place down to the ground. That's what the Indians did, and that's what Church's Rangers did. Colonel Zaleski makes the point that using Church's Rangers, those style tactics on modern day insurgents and terrorists would deny them safe havens. And he's absolutely correct. But what he's mistaking is ability and political will. When Josiah Wilson was the governor of the Plymouth Colony, he was directly appointed by the King of England. It was not a democratic institution at that time. It took weeks to months for information to go back and forth between England and the Plymouth Colony. So even if the King was interested in what was going on and had good details and was worried about the optics of using Indian style taxes against the Indians, it would be weeks to months for that information to go back and forth and for the king to say, hey, Winslow, cut it out. So that's not the case today. Today, pictures of dead civilians or purported dead civilians can be beamed around the world in minutes. Further, there's another problem. The Indians were not seen as sovereign, i.e. controlling their own territory. Exactly, there, there was some in between, but there was no real recognized border as far as between two sovereign nations. So that's not the case now. The whole reason you use uh, asymmetric warfare is because that you're weaker than your opponent and you want to uh, you want to maximize your impact while minimizing their ability to retaliate and one of the best ways to do that is force them to take actions that will cause them political difficulties. For instance, if I set up a camp across the border in Canada, and then I start attacking Niagara Falls, and then I run back across Canada after I conduct a raid, the problem is the American military can't easily follow me across there. I'm a criminal doing criminal stuff. The U.S. military going across the Canadian border, that's an invasion. Even if the U.S. military hired a third party, hired Lebanese out of Lebanon to cross the border, they're still acting as an agent of the government. They are still responsible to meet the laws and regulations, not only of the United States, but of the international community. If they don't do that, that puts them in the category of criminal. So. If you have people crossing a border causing an international incident, it becomes political. And who gets involved when something's political? Politicians. Even if we did adopt Colonel Selesky's idea, there are other issues besides the criminal and political issues that make this untenable. The reason why Church's Rangers worked is because the population density was very, very low. Lots of land, very few people concentrated in small areas. At the time, even if we went with the highest estimate of the number of Indians that lived in the United States and Canada, we come up with about 18 million people at the absolute maximum. And that gives you a population density of less than one person per square kilometer. Today, it's about 37 and a half people per square kilometer lot more people in the same area. So the ability to maneuver without being seen, without being detected, is very, very minute. And this is true throughout the world. As an example, 
the movie Lone Survivor, the book Lone Survivor, which was about Operation Red Wings. He had a four-man SEAL reconnaissance and surveillance team, guys highly trained on how to hide and sneak around in Afghanistan, in the mountains, and yet they were still exposed and attacked by Het Kamar affiliates. And because they were in the mountains, it was difficult to lose their pursuers. It was also really difficult to call for extraction. By the time they did, Hekimar was in place and the rescue was ambushed. They ended up losing a Chinook helicopter and a bunch more people. In total, 19 people. And it was weeks before the bodies were recovered. The obvious counter to what happened with Operation Red Wings is send a bigger force. Well, great, except for here's the problem. If it's too big and it's exposed, the insurgents will run away. They will avoid battle with superior forces, ceding ground for safety. That's what the Indians did. That's what criminals will do today. They're criminals. They're not soldiers. They're not there protecting anything other than themselves. Further, terrorists and insurgents will use NGOs and humanitarian agencies They'll hide amongst them. They'll conceal their weapons. They'll hang out in a hospital or a mosque or a church and they'll shoot from there. And if you fire back, you look like the bad guy because you're busy shooting up a hospital or a mosque. Insurgents will use human shields. It happened in Mogadishu, it happened in Iraq. That becomes a huge problem if we're shooting at what looks like women and children when in fact they're in front of a bunch of insurgents shooting at us. And again, because those images can be beamed around the world in seconds, that image will defeat you far more than the number of soldiers on that battlefield. I've said it before, I've said it again. War is a political fight with political goals. The idea is to defeat the enemy by defeating their ability to make war. It is not eradication. And since it is a political fight, that means politicians are involved and they're subject to the populace and the populace's ideas of what is fair and right and just, both domestically and internationally, as well as wherever the fight happens to be. Criminals don't have these problems. They don't have these same pressures. They're criminals. So we have to follow the law of land warfare, treaties, codes, conventions. It's all there to prevent eradication and genocide. It's there to say, if you must fight, this is how you do it. But the idea is to stop the enemy, not to eradicate a populace. Criminals don't care about that. To wrap things up, Church's Rangers and what they did during King Philip's War were based on a military necessity for survival. The colonists faced an existential threat. And even then, it probably wasn't really acceptable. But there's no way to stop it. Those conditions don't exist in the modern era. War is a political fight with violence, and as such, it has rules and limits. Criminals don't care about that. And trying to out-criminal the criminals, trying to out-savage terrorists, is never a good thing. So trying to replicate the actions of Church's Rangers would yield ineffective results. And the only way I would see the U.S. deciding on a total war strategy would be if Aliens from outer space landed and started to conquer the Earth. Then eradication might occur. Otherwise, we're soldiers and as such, we have limits on what we do and how we carry out our actions. Hope you enjoyed that. You see why I don't think total war is ever something we're going to face, nor should we. As always, a book recommendation. Out of the Mountains by David Kilcullen. Kilcullen's an excellent author, and if you've not read his stuff, I recommend very strongly that you do. He makes a really good case here, based on the urbanization of the, the world, where the next big fights we're going to have are going to be in urban operations. And I think he's half right. Now, insurgents are criminals, and criminals do go to where they can conduct crime, and that will be the cities. The problem is, successful insurgency requires the ability to maneuver, to hide. And that's gonna be very difficult to do in a urban setting. It also means that unless the city happens to be close to an international border, you can't though then go hide somewhere else, rearm, re-equip, get trained, and then come back and create more mayhem. Or at least it'll be a lot more difficult. 
It's also easier to control people in a smaller area than it is in a much wider area. But maybe I'm wrong. Give the book a read. Think about it. And if you disagree with me, as always, feel free. Have something to back it up, but feel free to disagree with me. And, uh, you know, send me an email or leave your comments below.